so it is we have faith without fear. Amen. Good morning, Landmark Church. Good to see you this morning. How's everybody? Good to see you. We're excited about this is week three of faith over fear and excited about what God is doing in our hearts and in our lives. There is a lot of fear, it seems like, in our society, but I'm so glad the Bible speaks to that and how we live during times like these. Amen? A couple of announcements before we get started this morning in the message. Uh, tonight is the last Connect group for this semester in our in, in particular group, particular groups. Uh, we'll have um, all church connect in May here at the church, um, and so we're excited about that, but tonight... So if you'll be glad to be a part of that, go join a group. It's a good way for you to get to know people, and uh, we're excited about that. And also, um, we're so thankful with our Hope Center. The other churches help us as well. For those of you that may be new, we have a Women's Hope Center there in the second service with us. But um, we have, I think, around 20 girls out there right now. But First Baptist Church is doing a garage sale Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and the proceeds are going to help our Hope Center. And so if you would like to go Thursday, Friday, or Saturday and uh, go buy stuff, listen, one man's junk is another man's treasure, or however you say that backwards, right? So uh, go find something. My wife's already said I'm going to be there early Thursday morning to get all the good stuff. But, um, but if you would like to contribute and you say, I've got stuff, but I don't like doing the garage sale kind of thing myself, if you want to give it to them, um, you can take it over there. Don't bring it here, please, because then we'll have to take it over there. Take it over there to their old sanctuary, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday from 10 to 12, and uh, they will be uh, getting things prepared. You can see Gail Wilson there, and uh, Miss Gail will be glad to help you get the stuff and take it wherever in the building needs to go. And then Thursday, Friday, and Saturday is the event. So anyway, amen. We're excited and thankful for other churches that can partner together to see our community change and to see lives um, that have been affected by drugs and alcohol and addiction, that God can change them and transform them. Amen? Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand up with me this morning? If you got your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 43. Hope you're awake today. Um, you got to amen me, help me a little bit. Our little Benjamin, 16-month-old, about 11 o'clock last night, we hear something on the monitor, Sarah wakes me up, and he has evidently got a stomach bug about seven times last night. He just was growing up. So anyway, we, uh, she was nice enough to go into the guest bedroom with him um, after a little while so I could get a little sleep because I have to preach today. And so I'm going to go home and give her a little break as soon as church is over this afternoon. But just praying that it's something and pray that we don't get it. I don't know. I don't know about you, but I don't like being sick. So we're believing we're going to be fine. So anyway, but um, for all of us, there's been a lot going on this weekend. So we're, we're going to hear the word of the Lord and we're not going to sleep while we're doing it. Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 43. I want to talk to you from this topic this morning. Faith for the future. Faith for the future. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not. For I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. Father, we just thank you for your word today. That your word challenges us and changes us. And Father, today we just pray for a fresh anointing, not only upon me to be able to speak your words, but a fresh anointing upon every person to have ears to hear, to have, Lord, the ability to see what you're saying to us, and then give us the boldness and the courage to live that out this week. Father, we just thank you for your word today that speaks life to our situation. We ask all these things in the mighty and the holy and the precious name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit and all God's people together said, amen. Turn around look at somebody and say, faith for the future, and you may be seated. This week, Sarah and I had the privilege of uh, going to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It was a very quick trip, um, but we went. I'm a part of a program, a three-year program. We usually meet twice a year, but uh, because of COVID this year, um, there's three meetings. We skipped one last year, but um, it's called Thriving in Pastoral Ministry, and it's just a, a way for pastors to get together and talk and just 
um, whether you know this or not, statistics at one time, I, I believe it was around 1,500, I think it's down now to 250, but that many pastors leave the ministry every single month. And so this program is just to help pastors get together and talk and, and, and just talk about life and, and just help one another. And so, But we knew going into this when I signed up that one of these was going to be a marriage conference. And so Sarah was going to go with me. And so it was supposed to happen last September once again because of COVID. It got pushed to April. And so last November, I come into the bedroom one night about ready to go to bed and Sarah is crying in the bedroom. And I'm like, typical guy, I'm trying to figure out, what did I do? Is, like, is it an anniversary? Did I forget something? Like, you know, did I leave the toothpaste lid off the toothpaste? Did I leave the, leave the toilet seat up? You know, what happened? Like, what did I do wrong? That's my first thought. I messed up, something happened, my wife is crying. And so I look at Sarah and I say, what's wrong? You know, what, what, why are you crying? And, and she said, we're, we're leaving Benjamin. I'm like, what? We, we got to leave Benjamin. I'm like... When are you talking about? She said, in April. I said, Sarah, it's November. Can we wait till closer to the date to cry about this, please? Can we wait just a little bit closer to cry? And so it was kind of a joke this week about that. But the truth is, even as we were preparing, this is our first time to ever leave him by himself for this long. We had another minister's retreat in March for our conference that we went to, left him overnight. We were 45 minutes away. This is the first time to be on an airplane, out of state, away from him, can't get to him quickly if something was to happen. And so all those thoughts raced through your mind. As we're flying to the airport, it was funny what Sarah and I were concerned about. She was worried that we were going to have a plane crash and die. And she's like, what happens if we die? I'm like, you won't know. You'll be dead. <clears throat> like, you'll be fine. Like, you know, you won't know any different. But Benjamin will be without parents. You know, and I'm like, well, once again, you won't know. You'll be fine. I was concerned with, you know, he's so he because he's the type he runs and he gets away from you quickly in a bathtub. You got to watch him because we have one of those seats, but he got big, too big for it. So it's like, you know, you don't want him falling in the water, something happening. You don't want him getting out somewhere. So I'm thinking along those lines, she just didn't want to fall. She thought he'll be taken care of. I just don't want to fall out of the sky. I've flown enough. I, and then, this is my encouragement. This is where I'm one of those very encouraging husbands. We're driving up there and I'm like, you realize we have a better chance of dying in a car crash on the way to the airport than we do the plane crashing and she's like you're not helping me one little bit the truth is though I even had a little bit of anxiety because once again you're leaving him you want to get home all of these things one of you is not with him those things are natural and I get that but if we're not careful we can allow fear to overtake us to where we can't even enjoy the moment because we're so fearful about what could happen we're so fearful about what is going to happen and, and most of us I think a lot of us we like you might not be a control freak type person but you want to know that if I do these certain things this is what's going to happen in my future I'm going to have a job when I go to work I'm going to be able to come home to my family I'm going to be able to cook and, and eat dinner with my we have all these things in mind for our future and we just want these things to happen but the truth is if we're honest today and I'm not trying to be negative or scare you the truth is none of us are promised tomorrow we're not promised a second. We really don't know what is going to happen. And if we're not careful, we, if we lean into that too much, we can be fearful about the future. We can be fearful about tomorrow. And if we're not careful, we will never actually live in the moment and do anything God wants us to do because we're so scared of what might happen that we never live in the moment. My thing is this. My, my biggest fear in life is not just being able to figure out where I'm going to go tomorrow. One of my fears in life is not doing today what God has called me to do and living life to the fullest now because I get so concerned with tomorrow not being present in the moment. And listen, it's not dying that scares me. It's not really living that scares me. It's that I don't understand what it means to live now because I'm so scared of the future. And here is Israel in this passage that we find them in this moment and they're in the fear of the unknown. They're in captivity. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know where they're headed. They don't know where, where they're going to live. What's going to happen? They're in captivity and they want to go back to Jerusalem. They want to go home and they're wondering, God, have you forsaken us? God, have you forgot about us? God, do you know what is happening? I was talking to a, a, a friend of mine last night at a wedding reception we're just out under this tent talking and and, and we both had this thought and we've we said it before but you know none of the stuff that's happened over the last year has surprised God God didn't fall off the throne and say I didn't see a pandemic coming like I had no idea 
I didn't see that people were going to go crazy and all these things. I didn't see. God said, I knew that people were going to go buy toilet paper like crazy. I knew that. Just kidding. You can laugh. That was supposed to be funny. Sorry. It was funnier in my head than you laughed. But, but the truth is this. Nothing that happens surprises God. And so here's, Israel is in this moment and they're wondering, God, have you forgot about us? God, have you forsaken us? God, have you left us? And God is speaking through Isaiah the prophet and he talks to them and he says to them, fear not. But he doesn't just say fear not because it's easy to say these things. If we're honest today, and I think about this in church when I'm preaching all the time, it's easy for me to get up and say cliches and say all this stuff and then you, go, you know what you, you think to yourself, you may think this, you may not, but some people think to themselves, well, preacher, that's a lot easier said than done. It's easier to said, say that, but what about when it's really happening? How do we live in the moment? And so God tells Israel, fear not, but he doesn't stop there. He gives us reasons. Fear not for. He says for, and the word for there, I'm about to tell you some reasons why you don't need to fear. And so he says, fear not, because number one, I have redeemed you. I've redeemed you. I bought you back. I have repurposed you. I have repositioned you in a place that I want you to be. I have redeemed your life. And here's the thing. I don't have to fear the future. And the good thing as a Christian, I don't have to fear the future of where I'm going. Do I really want to leave right now earth and pass away and miss my family? No, I really don't. I would love to see my son grow up and all of those things. But you know what the alternative is? If I was to pass away today from this life, the alternative is I get to see Jesus. I get to see him face to face. And that's not a bad thing. You understand that. For a Christian, death is not something that we should be afraid of. It should be not something we fear. But here's the reason. Because I have assurance today of where I'm going because I have been redeemed and I have put my hope and my faith in the fact that he has redeemed me and I've accepted that over my life. One of my favorite stories about redemption in the Bible, there's, there's several pictures in the Bible of redemption. My favorite one is Hosea. And here is Hosea, he's the young and upcoming preacher, he's the prophet, and he's single. And God says, Hosea, I got a wife for you. Hosea's going, mmm, thank you, Lord. Got me a wife. I bet it's Sally in the choir, Lord. I see her looking at me when I'm preaching. She amens me, and boy, man, just something about that lady, I, I mean, it's Sally, isn't it? The Lord says, nope, not Sally. Well, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's, one of these other ladies around the church. She's kind of my first pick, but, uh, you know, Lord, if you have somebody else, that's good. And the Lord says, no, it's not anybody in church. Matter of fact, I want you to go to the red light district, and I want you to find a wife. Hosea's like, what? You want me to go where? Yeah, you know those ladies walking on the street up there? I want you to go up to one of those and ask them if they'll marry you. Her name's going to be Gomer. He, he should have said, like, forget it, I'm done there, Okay. Sorry, I've watched too many Andy Griffith shows for that to be a, a girl's name. Like, it confuses me every time I read it. All I think is Gomer, Gomer Pyle, sorry. So that has ruined my Bible reading. But I want you to go marry a woman named Gomer. And the reason is because Israel has prostituted themselves to other nations and other gods. And I want to show Israel that I still love you even though you've done that. So I want you to go and marry Gomer. And he marries Gomer and they have children. And then one day he wakes up and Gomer's not laying in bed next to him. And he can't find her. And he goes looking throughout the city, where's my wife? And he finds her on a, a place where she's being sold. She's being sold into slavery. And the, and the truth is this, Gomer is not Hosea's property, but they're in covenant together. He is hers, she is his. They are one. They are in, they're in marriage. They're in covenant together. And in that moment, God says, I want you to take money, and I want you to buy her back. I want you to go. And so Hosea sits there and he outbids the highest bidder and he buys back his wife. And what he's saying is this, that's what redemption looks like. I am redeeming that which was already mine. She's mine. She's my wife. I'm her. She's mine. It's not that she's my property or I'm her property, but we're one. But I am buying back that which was already mine. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus went to the cross. We are already his. We are created in the image of God. We are created in his image. But he goes 
goes to the cross and he buys us back, not with silver or gold or the blood of animals, but the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And we have been redeemed. We are redeemed today. I don't have to fear. I've been redeemed. I know who my Savior is and I don't have to fear tomorrow. Jesus said it this way, fear not him who can kill the body. In other words, don't fear people, but fear him who can, who can take both body and soul. My fear today is not in people. My fear today is not even in my circumstances. I have a holy reverence and a fear of God, but I don't have to live in fear of the future and what's going to happen because number one, I have been redeemed. Amen? And then number two, he says this, he knows us. Not only have you been redeemed, he knows us. I have called you by your name, child, you are mine. One of my first trips overseas was, it might have been my first one, but I went to Israel when I was 18 years old, and I literally, and some of you have heard this story, but I literally turned 18 flying over the ocean. I was a typical 18-year-old brat. I was tired. We had flown from Jackson, Mississippi to Atlanta to New York, and then got on a plane to go to um, fly into Germany just long enough to stay on the plane and then fly into Amman, Jordan. And so we're on the plane all day long, and we're flying from New York <clears throat> to our first leg of Germany, several hours. We're just exhausted, tired. I'm sitting between people, so I can't hardly get up, and I'm just sitting there, got headphones on, and somebody taps me on the shoulder and says, take your headphones off. And once again, being a typical teenager, I'm like, why? Take your headphones off. I'm thinking, I don't want to take my headphones off. I'm exhausted. I'm listening to music. Just leave me alone. Let me sit here. And, and then after what happened, I felt bad for saying that because all of a sudden, over the loudspeaker comes the captain's voice. And he's speaking Arabic, and I can't understand anything that he's saying. So he's just speaking, I can't understand it. But then all of a sudden, I hear, Abba, Justin Blankenship. And the entire plane erupts into clapping. And the stewardess walks up with a little cake. And 18 years old, on an airplane, they had a birthday party just for me. I couldn't understand everything he said, but I understood when he called me by my name. And what I love about what God says is this, what, what God tells Israel, Israel, I have called you by your name. I'm not calling you by any name. You ever grow up with a grandparent, they, would, they couldn't remember your name, so they would say eight names, and then they finally get to you, whoever you are. You know, you, could, you didn't feel real special after that time, right? Whatever your name is, you, I'm talking to you. I don't remember what it is, because I got so many grandkids, or maybe it was your mom or dad. I got so many kids, can't remember it all. But God says, no, I have called you by your name. Child, you're mine. I love you. I know who you are. I know what you're going through. I know what is happening, and I know exactly where you're at. So today when you feel forsaken and forgotten and you feel like, does anybody even know me? God says, I don't just call you any old name. I call you by your name. You are mine. I love you. I don't have to fear tomorrow because I have a Savior. I have a God who loves me, who wants to spend time with me, who enjoys being around me, and he knows my name. Amen? We heard this week from uh, Dr. Ferguson, um, David and Teresa Ferguson heard a story um, that I really enjoyed. And Dr. Ferguson said they had a grandchild that they were watching overnight one night. And he said, he said when our kids were, and some of you remember this, when our kids were a certain age, you had to hear them. If, if, you, if they were taking a nap, you, heard, you hoped you heard them screaming so you could go in there. You didn't have monitors and all these things. But he said, we had a monitor for our grandchild. And so we're watching our grandchild. We're watching him sleep. And then all of a sudden, he wakes up, and he said, my wife got so excited. She was so excited he woke up. I thought, because you're a grandparent, not a parent. There's a difference. <laughs> but he said she was so excited that he woke up because she jumps up fast, and she wants to run in there, and she said, he's awake. I get to spend time with him. And he said his, his wife went to get the grandchild. In that moment, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, that's how I feel about you every day single morning i love it when you wake up because i just get to spend time with you think about that 
God loves for you to be awake so he can just spend time with you. He loves being around you. You don't have to always be in this constant thing where sometimes you can ride down the road with your wife and, and your, or your husband or a friend. You don't have to say a word. Just the fact that you're around each other makes the difference. And the truth is this. You don't always have to be thou beest goddess all the time, okay? There, you can just be riding down the road, but the fact that you are with him in his presence and he is with you, God loves that. God loves to be around you. I love that. I don't like being around around myself half the time, okay? But God likes being around me. He loves me. And I don't have to fear the future because I've got a God who's not distant, who's not off somewhere saying, I hope you make it. I helped you a long time ago. I hope you got it good. I've got a God who loves me. He knows my name. And he's glad that I'm awake and I can spend time with him. I am his. And because of that, I don't have to fear the future. Amen? And then number three, he is with us. He says, when you walk through the fire, I will be with you. And when you walk through the waters, they won't overtake you. Think about the three Hebrew boys. They get thrown into the fire. But what happens when they're thrown into the fire? Number one, there's a fourth man walking in the fire. That even though they're in the fire, there is somebody else with them that is greater than what they're walking through. And then, I love this part, because when they come out, I, we used to have a place growing up in our town called Junior Food Mart, and it was the fried chicken capital of Crystal Springs, Mississippi. You want a good fried chicken? You went in this gas station. And literally, even if you didn't get fried chicken, if you went inside to pay for your gas, so you'd walk up to somebody and say, you've been at Junior Food Mart, haven't you? You could drive by there, and you would smell like Junior Food Mart. I mean, you, you would know. Have you ever been out camping? You don't have to get close to the fire, and you smell like the smoke. Were you camping while well, I was over at campsite? Oh, we didn't have a fire going, but somebody else over there did, and I had it. The three Hebrew boys are in the fire. They're inside of the flames, seven times hotter than it's ever been. And number one, they survive. But then number two, they walk out, and you can't even tell they've been through the fire. Not one singe of their hair has been, not one part of their hair has been singed. There's no smoke that they smell. They walk out, and it's like nothing has happened to them. And I want you to know today what God says is, I am with you. There is still a fourth man walking in the fire. He doesn't say we won't go through through hard times. He doesn't say we won't go through difficulties. He doesn't say we won't have waters that feel like they're overtaking us. He won't, He's not saying you won't go through the fire, but what he says is this, you'll go through the water, but you will not drown, and you'll go through the fire, and you will not be consumed, because I am your God. You're not going to be scorched. You're not going to drown, because I am with you. Amen? And today, I don't have to fear because he's with us. He's still walking with me in the middle of my problems, in the middle of my situation, that I have a God who loves me abundantly. He has never given up on me. He has never forsaken me. And he says, I have redeemed you. You are mine. And when you go through things, you will make it out on the other side. And I believe on the other side, it's going to be even better than you could have imagined. And you're not going to have to be remembered by all those things that happen. But instead, on the other side, other side there's healing and there's wholeness and when you walk out on the other side people will see you and say I saw that person go through the fire but they made it I saw that person go through the water but it didn't overtake them and listen to me when you get out on the other side your story becomes a testimony of the goodness and the grace of God so that others can realize that God is no respecter of persons if he did it for you I know he'll do it for me I'm better looking I know he'll do it for me like I I'm just kidding if he did it for you, I know he'll do it for me because God loves me or just as much as he loves you. And if he did it for you, then he will do it. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I realize no matter what I go through, it's going to happen. He is going to be with me. Amen. If the worship team will join me, I'm almost done. You've been redeemed. You've been called by your name. You are his. And he is with you. Then he ends that passage, verse 5, by saying, fear not. For I gave Egypt as your ransom. I gave Egypt to you. And, and God there is pulling on imagery of the Old Testament. And when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. And if you remember the story, they come out of Egypt and not only does God protect them. You have Pharaoh's army who is barreling down on them. And, and they run out into the middle of the sea. Because here is Israel who's walked across on dry land. And here comes Pharaoh's army, and they're barreling down in the middle of the waters, and the waters 
overtake them. And what do they sing on the other side? The horse and the rider have been thrown into the sea. That God did. But then he says this, I gave Egypt as your ransom. You realize whenever Israel walked out, they didn't walk out of that the same way they came in. They came in to the, to the waters on Egypt's side. They came into that thing slaves. They're, they're, they're poor. They have nothing. But when they walk out of Egypt, the Bible says that they took all the possessions or parts of the possessions of Egypt with them. That they left better than when they came in. And what God is saying to Israel is this. Israel, I'm trying to show you I've done it before so I can do it again. How does God prove to us that he's going to do it? Because God is a faithful God. And his point is this. If I've done it before, I'm a consistent God. I can do it again. I gave Egypt your ransom. I gave you what you needed. Fear not. I am the Lord your God. There's no other God like me. There's no other God before me. And I've already proven myself many, many times. And God says, you can trust me. I don't have to prove it again. I've already proved it to you. But if you need me to, I'll be glad to show you some other things. I'll show you what I can do. Because time and time again, I just want you to know you can trust me. And today, some of you walk in here with fear gripping your heart about the future. What's going to happen? Fear of tomorrow, fear of next week. Will I have a job? Will I have a marriage? Will my family be with me? The situation I'm facing is difficult, and I don't know what tomorrow holds. And I can't promise you that everything's going to work out today the way you want it to work out. But what I can promise you is this. You have a God who's already been in tomorrow, and He is with you. He has redeemed you. He loved you enough to send His Son 2,000 years ago to die for you so that you could be redeemed, bought back by the blood of the Lamb. And He says, I've called you by your name. I know specifically what you're going through. I know who you are, and you are mine. And I'm with you. You may go through the waters, but you're not going to drown. And you may go through the fire, but I can protect you. And today, no matter what you're going through, you can allow the enemy to, to heap fear on you and, and, and just worry and anxiousness. And I'll be honest with you, even this week as we left to go to Myrtle Beach and we're sitting in a class for a marriage retreat, and it was very good information, and we loved it, and I, and I got a lot out of it. But I had to keep telling myself, I had to remind myself over and over, be present. Because... The, it's funny, you think the wife would be doing this, the mom. I'm over there, have you texted your mom to see how he's doing? Have you asked how he's doing right now? It's like I just did five minutes ago. Well, ask again. Ask again, make sure he's okay. That, that fear can grip your heart to where you can't even enjoy the moment or what's going on because all you're worried about is what's next. And God says, I want you to have faith. Just trust me. Trust me. No matter what happens, I'm with you. We're going to get through this thing together. No matter how difficult it is, we're going to make it. And we have to trust. Faith is how we conquer fear. We don't conquer fear by just bringing up these things and trying to hype ourselves up. Because you know what? The moment that goes away, you fall right back into fear. But I have to walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is how I conquer fear. So I realize I don't have to fear because God has done these things for me. And He is with me. We stand up this morning. worship team's going to sing a song. It's a song of victory. But in the midst of this song of victory, maybe you don't feel victorious. I'll be honest, a moment ago not as we were standing here, I raised both hands. I thought, Lord, I'm tired. Part of me just doesn't feel like worshiping right now, if I'm being honest. I'm exhausted. I love half the night. I'm tired. But I realize worship is what focuses me on who He is and not on what, who I am. Worship is what helps me realize it's the weapon that I use to come against the me that tries to do everything he can in my life to distract me and pull me away. And so right now, we're going to sing a song of victory. And maybe you don't feel it, but I want you to sing it anyway. But in this moment, if you say, I'm carrying a burden, and I just need somebody to help me, I need to know God is with me. Listen, we don't want you to carry this alone. We have people that are here to pray for you. They'll prophesy over your life. They'll speak words of wisdom into you right now. If you just 
say, I am carrying something and I don't need it right now. As we sing a song of victory, I encourage you, find one of these people. Let's pray if you want to go to the altar, but give it to the Lord. Don't walk out of here letting fear seize your heart, but walk out of here with faith knowing you have been redeemed, you are called by your name, that you are his, and know that he is with you. Amen. Let's worship together, and let's come and give some things to Jesus right now. As you exit today, the ushers are in the doorway. I want to pray over the offering, but 
if you don't have you know cash or check to give there you can give online too or on our church app and uh, we thank you for your faithfulness but let's pray over the offering and tithe lord we thank you that we have the opportunity to obey and to also give an offering lord we pray that this money would find those who need help or that it would find those who need to find you and lord we thank you that this is one of the many ways that you are furthering your kingdom and we are so happy we get to be a part of that lord we ask that you bless this week in jesus name amen and amen you are dismissed god bless you